one sentence summary, Bond travels to Switzerland to investigate crimes and harass the locals. Could you beat the villain? So Ernest Stavro Blofeld is back. He's gone from a cat stroking planner to an action hero. Uh, now he can ski, he can fist fight Bond, he can do germ warfare. He's a real threat. Uh, but if I were Bond, no problem at all. As soon as I'd see him, I would murder him. Because I'm going there to get revenge. Just as soon as he's like, hey, look, that's Blofeld. Cha -cha! But yeah, Bond doesn't do that. He and Blofeld play this like stupid game where they pretend they don't know each other. Even though it's a different act for, actor for Blofeld, fair enough. And he's allegedly had some surgery to like cut his ears off or cut the earlobes off. But like, Bond is the same person. Like, different actor again, but same person. And Blofeld is the same person. So he might have had a bit of plastic surgery, but... So, yeah, I, I could win, is what I'm saying. Let's talk about the women in this film. Uh, somehow, even though the, this is, you know, one of the later ones, Sean Connery's had a good few of them, and this is like a late 60s one, you'd think the sexism would get better, but it actually gets worse. Um, so the film opens with Bond saving a woman from killing herself. Tracy says she owes Bond a, like a debt, so she has sex with him to pay it off. All right, cool. Um, and then her dad, Tracy's dad, uh, wants Bond to like basically sex the depression out of her, which is a plan even Bond thinks is stupid. <coughs> Offers to take Money Penny on a date after groping her in the office. Uh, even though he knows he's about to leave and try and seduce Tracy to get some information on Blofeld. And Bond spends an awful lot of time, like, seducing these women in Blofeld's facility. And then later that same evening, he's all like, oh, Tracy, I love you. Let's get married. Spoiler alert, Bond gets married at the end. Uh, and he invites Moneypenny to the wedding. That's just rude. Uh, Bond is also not afraid to hit a woman in the face when she says something he doesn't like. And this film does end with Bond on top of a woman, but it's not at sea, so that is different to the other films. Vodka Martini, shaken not stirred, is said in this film. Bond James Bond, no I don't think it is said in this film. Uh, is there a car chase? There is. Tracy saves Bond's ass with some pretty good tactical driving, but I feel sorry for the, uh, the racing drivers whose day was ruined. Uh, the big stunt. It's probably the bit where Bond slides along a curling track on his stomach whilst firing a machine gun. That was pretty cool. Or you could have the bit where he's hanging from cable cars up a mountain. Whichever. <laughs> Let's talk about the music. The Christmas tree song in this pissed me off. I don't know why. How is there only one song being played in that whole fucking town? How would you improve this film? So the, the biggest waste of potential in my opinion was Tracy. She seemed to be very capable. She steals a gun off Bond twice. She defends herself against one of Blofeld's henchmen and she doesn't take no shit. Um, and then when her dad and Bond show up, she either becomes a damsel in distress or a spoiled brat. Uh, part of that has got to be that her dad is also willing to punch her in the face. Uh, so there's some daddy issues there. Anyway. Bond is driving a car at dusk whilst wearing sunglasses. He also has zoom and enhanced technology on a gun sight, and the edges of that gun sight are transparent. So I don't think he was really looking through a little telescopey thing there. Bond sees a lady walking into the sea. He's like, oh no, she's going to go kill herself. So he drives his car onto the beach, uh, so there's less running required until he gets there. But he still leaves it like a hundred foot to run. Strange. And then Drama happens, Tracy steals his car, drives back up to the uh, top of the dunes and then gets in her own car and drives off. Just, it's not that far, just run. Bond is in a scuffle with a dude on the sand on a beach and then all of a sudden they're like 20 foot into the sea, it's coming up to their waist or whatever, strange. Bond turns up to a, a hotel. He's like, that red coot. I was about to do the Sean Connery voice there. That red cougar outside. Uh, does it belong to a lady? And the hotel employee's like, yeah, blah, 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 blah. Whoever. GDPR, all right? You can't be telling people all that private information, sir. 
There is some slow scenes of Bond checking into his hotel and then playing card games that we really didn't need to see. And Tracy has reintroduced boob first. Previously, in other films, Bond has gone to great lengths to spy-proof his hotel rooms. Apparently, he doesn't bother doing it on this one, because Tracy sneaks into his room. He's all like, I think you're in trouble. She tried to kill herself yesterday, and she's been talking about how she doesn't want to survive. Are you some sort of detective now, James Bond? How long is the drive that Bond is taken on by some hired goons? Because it's morning when they set off but then it is dark when they uh, arrive at the location. Anyway, Bond faked his death in the last film to get some of the heat off him. But in this film, Draco, who's like a criminal dude and Tracy's dad, knows exactly who he is. So I bring up the point again, if you're gonna fake your death, you've got to start using a different name when you introduce yourself, James Bond. Draco, he's all like, well, what do you know about me? And Bond is like, well, you've got some criminal stuff going on and you uh, run construction businesses. No, James Bond. Draco introduced himself as running construction businesses. You can't just repeat information and make it sound like you know stuff. Oh, I've been informed of everything you did with my daughter. Everything? Oh, don't worry about it. It's fine. Because, like, it's not fine. And Draco's relationship to James Bond in this film and his daughter is very strange. Like... Bond gets told he's had two years to uh, find Blofeld and he hasn't done it, so he's being reassigned by M. So he throws a tantrum and asks Moneypenny to quit for him. Mature. And Bond has got a suitcase in his office and you think, oh well, you know, he's got that there because if he needs to go on missions straight away, he's got it. But the suitcase hasn't already got like an overnight bag packed in it, which is strange. And... He's going through like mementos of the past films, like the title sequence, to really hammer home that it's a different actor, same character. And we see a, a watch with a garrote wire, and I don't think we've seen him use that in one of these films before. So what's he remembering there? Akko's girlfriend seems to be the same age of his daughter. Bit, bit creepy. And at his birthday, there's a bullfighter who gets hit by a bull twice. I don't, I don't think the bullfighter understands the the nature of this thing. He's not supposed to get hit by the balls. Montage is a lazy way to build a relationship and also Bond's kind of infatuation and seduction of Tracy happens in less than two weeks because that's how much time he was given on holiday. And then... There's poor bears in that cage in Switzerland. That was an awful zoo. It was basically just a big concrete cube they were in. Bond thinks he's got a location for Blofeld's accountant. So he sneaks into the office. Number one. Why has that accountant got a copy of Playboy in his office? That doesn't seem very professional. Number two. Why is there so much tension if the accountant will come back and discover Bond in his office? Because I get the feeling that if it came to it, Bond could take this guy. Number three. Why does Bond continue uh, reading the Playboy as he's leaving the office? If he didn't want to arouse suspicion, that's something you shouldn't do, walking through a corridor like, hey, have a look at these. Anyway. Number four, there's a safe cracking slash scanner machine that seems a bit too convenient. It's not even two machines, all right? Why did someone build this? Bond goes undercover, uh, so he does use a different name to be fair, working as Sir Hilary Bray for the London College of Arms because Blofeld's plan is he's faked his death and he's pretending to be one of his distant relatives who can then inherit all of the Blofeld estate or something like that. Blofeld's guys, they're like, uh, Sir Hilary from the London College of Arms, who we've not met. Send us a description of yourself so we can come and pick you up when you arrive in Switzerland. Why not just ask for a photograph? Because then you'd know exactly what he looks like and no one's going to do any skullduggery and swap. Irma Bunt, she's like the equivalent of odd job in this film, but she doesn't do any fisticuffs. 
Or does she? She does a bit of flying. Anyway, uh, she's on a helicopter tour with Bond and she points out avalanche damage and that's about it. So that kind of highlights that later in this film, there's going to be an avalanche. <laughs> I understand that Blofeld took over this mountaintop building and it was originally something to do with the Olympics. Okay, fine. But I don't understand why his henchmen, some of them wear Olympic coats. <laughs> Bond, as Sir Hilary Bray, is taken to his room and Irma Bunt says, oh, the doors are locked because the Count, Blofeld's alias, is very big on uh, undisturbed rest. So, you know, you've got to ask to leave. People aren't just wandering around all the time. Hmm, fair enough. Makes sense if it's like a rest and recuperation kind of thing. And then a helicopter flies past the window. <laughs> Why are the women at Blofeld's kind of clinic facility up a mountain dressed like they're going out all the time? Why don't they have any casual clothes? And there's a lot of overhead shots of people eating at a dinner table scene. And I assume that is to focus on the food they're eating, not to get shots down the tops of ladies' tops. Also, why are they on multiple tables? Why not just have one big table? That seems like the most efficient thing. The most awkward and questionable part of the dinner scene, there's going to be a lot about the dinner scene, is you get a shot of what everyone's eating. So you see like an Asian lady, she's eating some rice and you're like, okay. Then you see like an Indian lady and she seems to be like eating a curry or something like, all right. And then you see like an Afro-Caribbean lady who is eating a banana. And that's when I realized someone's done this on purpose, haven't they? They've, they've thought this is a good idea. Bond, undercover, is um, rambling on about the College of Arms and the, the young woman sitting next to him is proper thirsty if you catch my drift. And she's like, oh, I'd love to see this book that you're talking about and especially the section about golden balls. And Bond's like, well, oh, you know what? I'll bring it to your room later. And Irma Bunt, fair enough. He's like, no, we're not going to do that. All right, just give me the book. I'll show it to any of these young women that want to see it. And Bond's all like, oh, rats. And the uh, young lady who's sitting next to Bond, she's not having none of this. No, no blocking from Irma Bunt over here. So Bond, wearing a kilt, uh, has her room number written on his leg and like lipstick or something. And Irma Bunt notices, you know, uh, changing his demeanour. She's all like, oh, what's up with you? And he's like, well, I've just got a stiff neck because of the altitude. Okay, fair enough. And then Bond leaves to go and talk to Blofeld. And this, is, this was a bit that confused me when I saw it because I wasn't really sure what was going on. But one of the women says, oh, well, I know what he's allergic to. And I was like, well, well what's going on? Is it interesting conversation by any chance? And then later in the film, the thirsty woman, I, I didn't learn their names. She was like, oh, it's how, so strange that you're acting like you don't like girls. And I was like, wait, so the, I know what he's allergic to was like alleging that he was gay just because he was going on about the College of Arms and heraldry and all that coats of arms and stuff. I don't understand that at all because they asked him to talk about it. is why he actually brought the book about heraldry to the young woman's room. Because I think the book might have just been a cover to get you into her room, James Bond. That's... Irma Bunt picked up on it. Anyway. Bond repeats the same pickup lines on multiple women at Blofeld's facility. It's like he's not even trying, but he just has to like try and have sex with as many women as possible. So like, he's clearly got some sort of psychological damage. Another agent who's shadowing Bond, which is probably a good idea. Maybe they should work in tandem a lot more often than letting this rogue go wherever he please and cause damage. And I really like the bit where he's caught climbing up to Blofeld's facility and the guards are like taking his stuff. And he's like, hey, what about all my clubber, my belongings? Uh, there is a dodgy ass cut though where they seem to have edited out some of the conversation so the guy's like jumps from here to like there. But there you go. In the last film, Blofeld, who had a different face, he stroked a cat odd. It's like it was very unnatural to him. This continues, 
by the way he smokes a cigarette in this film. Now I'm not an expert. Have I got a pen or anything around here? I haven't. But like he he holds a cigarette like that, so it's in there, and like surely that's going to burn your hand. I, I don't know. Maybe it was the style at the time. It's strange to me how Blofeld has got this facility up a mountain, but he doesn't have like a prison room. Bearing in mind all of the the bedrooms, they're on automatic doors, and you can't just open it. You've got to ask for permission. But basically, when they capture Bond, they're like, look, you're in prison now. Stop dicking around. They put him in like a gear room where the cable car gubbins is strange. Why was Q in this at the beginning just to talk about radioactive lint when it has no bearing on the plot and uh, Bond is given no gadgets? <laughs> then Bond rips out his pockets to use them as gloves. Number one, trousers poorly made. Number two, is um he's walking around with holes in his trousers the rest of the evening <laughs> bit with the uh, cable car bond escaping goes on too long and no matter what way the kind of cable car is moving that way or that way up or down the mountain the cable seems to take bond towards the big gears and it's like oh no i'm gonna get mushed there you go <laughs> bond knocks out a guard and ties him up and you know deposits him in a supply room then presumably changes in front of that man and taunts him with two witty barbs. Don't do that. Either say, Merry Christmas, or maybe you should have been gift wrapped. Don't do both, because the guy's unconscious, he can't hear you being funny anyway. We don't need to see all of the henchmen make the same uh, ski jump as Bond does. and We don't need to see so much of the henchmen's reactions to everything that happens. Bond crashes twice in his little ski escape. I quite like that. It shows he's not an expert at everything. Um, and they've artificially made the scene darker, but they haven't done it to the same level in different shots. So sometimes it's like pitch black. Sometimes it's dusk. It's strange to me that Bond's running through this uh, little town with a crappy Christmas song, trying to escape all the henchmen and the goons, instead of just like taking them out. Because there's even some bits where he's like one on one, like, oh no, I've got to scramble through this window. No, I just... Beat them up and break their necks or something. I don't know. Do some, do some murder. You seem to love that usually. It's not even like he's injured or anything like that, which would explain why he doesn't want to fight anyone. Anyways. I think there's like genuine fear in George Lazenby's face when he turns around and there's someone in a polar bear costume and they flash a camera in his face. And I think that was like, you can see the expression on his face. I don't think he was expecting it. There you go. It is pretty mental that Tracy shows up at random in this little Swiss town and that's how Bond escapes the people chasing him. That is very, very convenient. And also, if you pull your collar up over your face when you're directly in the sight of someone who's looking for you, that's probably going to attract more attention than if you didn't. Stop harassing people when they are driving, particularly Tracy. She's doing, you know, she's driving an escape. She's doing pretty well obviously some sort of expert training. Bond, you gotta stop kissing her, you gotta stop patronizing her. And there's a weird rose trim, oh actually in that escape as well, Bond's expert advice is to turn into a crowd of civilians to hopefully like put off the people pursuing them. He's a sociopath. <laughs> there's a weird rose tinted kind of soft lens thing that's used when Bond and Tracy are hiding in this romantic barn. And it's, it's very odd that it, there's like a snowstorm and all that sort of stuff. That's why they couldn't even drive no further because their car died or something. But it's weird that Tracy takes her clothes off and just keeps her pants and her coats on. Because you'd think you'd want as many layers on as possible. <laughs> we don't need another ski chase. We've already had one. And you've got to feel bad for the henchman who fell into like a snow plow and gets gutted, but you gotta feel worse for his uh, his comrades who then have to dive through the snow that is tinted red. Gross. Uh, Bond and Tracy fall in that avalanche that was Chekhov'd earlier, uh, and it's like two minutes, they're going, oh no, avalanche, and they both survive, 
And it's strange that Blofeld, he knows Tracy survived because he takes her hostage, but he's also like, yeah, Bond's probably dead. Mm. Bond has a flashback to events we just saw, and that's... No, Diana Riggs is like super hot, but it's so strange to me that Blofeld immediately like falls in love with her and asks her to be his queen. Because uh, his whole thing is he's got a bunch of young women in short skirts hanging around his facility, and we don't hear any rumours that, oh, the, the, uh, the Count comes and visits you at night. Although that would like parallel the Blofeld and Bond are the same. But anyway, like, as soon as he meets Tracy, he's like, you and me, we're endgame. I love you. And she's all like, mm, no, I don't, I don't think that's true. And then she realises that she's got a stall. She's like, actually, tell me more about your creepy plan to seduce me with Stockholm Syndrome. Anyway. There's a dodgy ass cut where two shots of a helicopter are stitched into one. If you can't get two helicopters in the same shot, just do them one at a time, that's what I'm saying. And had Blofeld not been looking at his secret map when Bond was in the room uh, and regaining consciousness, Bond wouldn't have known there was a secret map there and the day would have been, you know, ruined, depending on who you're looking at. Ruined from the world's perspective, but better from Blofeld's because he would have got what he wanted. Why is the timer for the uh, explosives to destroy the facility set at uh, 5 minutes and 10 seconds? That's an odd time. Also, there isn't 5 minutes and 10 seconds between the timer being done and the explosion going off. Blofeld can steer a toboggan without even looking where he's going. Where did he get that grenade from and why was the timer so, so long? And wh where did that St Bernard come from? That big dog who helps Bond. And why is he advertising a particular brand of whiskey at the end? Shame on you, Bond. Why are Q's lines so rushed at the end of the film when he's at the wedding? And why does he say 007 never had any respect for government property? Is that hat that you're talking about government property? Does Bond not own any of his own stuff? Hmm. And Bond drives an updated Aston Martin. Um, so not like the one that Sean Connery had. But that one had bulletproof glass. We know that for a fact. But this one that he drives now does not have bulletproof glass. Why is that? Also, if it did, Tracy would still be alive. Anyway, rating out of five beers. It feels like the Tracy story and the Blofeld story were separate and should not have been combined because this went on for way too long. Much like this review. Goon pushes Bond uh, through a door. So the next door that Bond walks through he slams it on the guy with a really petty kind of action. I like that. But there was there were less quips and, you know, less fun to be had with this one. It was pretty serious and dour sometimes. Um, so, yeah, four out of five beers. It could have been better.